Good evening and welcome to your local election headquarters. I'm Jessica Garete. Three candidates have made it on the ballot as they look to replace current Democratic Attorney General Hector Balderas, who's wrapping up his second and final term. Early voting for the primary election kicks off tomorrow. And tonight, we are joined by the Democratic candidates Raul Torres and Brian Colon as they go head to head to win their party's nomination. The Attorney General for the state of New Mexico on average prosecutes 1,500 criminal and civil cases a year. There's more than 200 employees that oversee several divisions, including internet crimes against children, criminal appeals, and consumer protection. The AG also takes on big investigations into public officials where there are conflicts of interest. Raul Torres was born and raised in New Mexico. Torres attended Harvard University, the London School of Economics, and Stanford Law School. He worked as an assistant district attorney and assistant attorney general. Torres was sworn in as the Bernalillo County District Attorney in 2017. Brian Colon graduated from New Mexico State University with a bachelor's degree in finance and earned a law degree from the University of New Mexico School of Law. Colon served on the New Mexico Hispanic Bar Association's Board of Directors since 2001 and was twice appointed by the New Mexico Supreme Court as a commissioner for the J Judicial Selection Commission. He also served as the chairman of the Democratic Party of New Mexico. Colon was elected as New Mexico State Auditor in 2018. Here are the rules for tonight's hour-long commercial-free debate. There are no opening statements. Candidates get a minute 30 seconds to answer questions. We'll also ask follow-up questions and interject from time to time in order to keep the discussion on track. We flipped a coin to see who gets the first turn to answer a question and we'll alternate from there on out. Finally, each candidate will have a minute to make a closing statement. The order of closing statement was also determined by a coin toss. And we start today with crime. As everyone knows, crime has been increasing at an alarming rate in our state. The FBI director even called our record number of murders truly horrifying. As Attorney General, tell us the first thing you'll do to tackle our violent crime problem. We start with Mr. Torres, who won the coin toss. Well, thank you, Jessica. I really appreciate the opportunity to be with the viewers tonight. Uh, the first thing we need to do to tackle crime is to gather together the key stakeholders inside the criminal justice system and, and the Department of Public Safety so that we can start breaking down the barriers of communication that exist within law enforcement agencies. One of the things I'm proud to have done as the district attorney is to partner with a local firm that specializes in advanced analytics. And what we've done is in conjunction with working at, at Sandia National Labs and New Mexico Tech, we're actually building the first ever data platform that will enable both prosecutors, police officers, and crime analysts to see crime unfolding in real time. That will give us a specific uh, place to start in terms in, of enforcement and prosecution. But we can't just look at it from, from the enforcement side. We also have to gather together stakeholders to talk about diversion, uh, addiction treatment, and mental health services. We've actually increased uh, addiction and diversion opportunities in my office by 200% in my time in office. I'm extremely proud of that. What we need to do are take some of those lower level offenders, get them out of our system, get them treatment and help, and focus exclusively on the most violent and dangerous repeat offenders. And last but not least, we have to shut the revolving door. This is something that I've advocated for. I know it's something that we can fix. We have a common sense solution and approach that I think will make all New Mexican families safer. All right, thank you, Mr. Torres. Mr. Colon, tell us the first thing you'll do to tackle our violent crime problem. Well, I think first, Jessica, we've got to bring people together. We've got district attorneys from all over the state who are failing to communicate with one another. And at the end of the day, without communication, you can't have success. Families are scared. Even just this past weekend, we had six people who were shot, four of whom are dead <coughs> because of failed communication. You know, we can talk a lot about data, but at the end of the day, we're as unsafe as we've ever been in Bernalillo County. And so for me, you've got to bring together multidisciplinary agencies, stakeholders, and make sure that we engage them in a conversation. Now, what's different between me and my opponent in this race is I've got a long track record of doing just that. There's a reason that several district attorneys from all over the state have endorsed our campaign. The sheriffs have endorsed our campaign to be the next attorney general because we engage well. We set a table. People feel seen and heard. And that's how you move forward on these difficult challenges. Look. At the end of the day, I've been doing work in the sector to rebuild our mental health uh, network and our behavioral health network in New Mexico since it was decimated by Susana Martinez. We know that that's happened. We know that's an issue. And until we come together to work together, 
to rebuild that system and then make sure that we protect their families, especially from those most violent criminals in Bernalillo County and in New Mexico. All right, thank you, Mr. Colon. We will be uh, going a little deeper into mental health in a moment, but first, as uh, Mr. Torres has mentioned, the revolving door. A lot of the blame for our crime skyrocketing has been placed on pretrial detention. Voters passed a constitutional amendment overhauling the state's criminal bail system to keep people from being jailed because they were poor. It has now led to judges releasing more accused criminals while they await trial. DA Torres argues those accused criminals aren't being monitored closely and commit more crimes while out awaiting trial. Mr. Torres, you've been fighting for the state to make it harder for certain suspects to get out of jail. But opponents argue it would prevent very few crimes and raise constitutional rights concerns. The Legislative Finance Committee also determined that little evidence exists to suggest that bail reform is driving violent crime here. It's Mr. Colon's turn to start. Your thoughts on if we should change pretrial detention to battle crime. Look, here's the issue, Jessica. You've got to have leadership in these conversations. Unfortunately, we've been lacking in that. One cannot, cannot engage in a conversation about changing constitutional burdens and responsibilities from the state to defendants unless you bring the stakeholders together to make sure that we have that full conversation about the entire system. If we're going to increase the burden for our public defenders and for our communities of color and people who have an overrepresentation of incarceration, people in poverty, then we best talk about are we appropriately funding the public defender's office and those other stakeholders that serve those communities. So for me, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to protect victims and our families in New Mexico. If that means we change the, the system for pretrial detention, I'm for that conversation. But you can't do it in a vacuum. And the difference between me and my opponent is that we've got a track record of advancing legislation. We've got a track record of having support from a majority of the Democratic legislators in Santa Fe to work together for these solutions that we've identified to push back on crime in our communities. Look, our families don't feel safe. That's the bottom line. So anything we can do, whether it's the revolving door on the front that my, my uh, friend Mr. Torres would like to talk about, or it's the door on the back where we're failing to prosecute. Look, the prosecution rates are an issue, and I know we're gonna talk about that tonight, but you can't talk about the front door without talking about the back. And then having reintegration programs for those people who have, have served their time, who've made the community whole after they've made those poor choices, do we have a way for them to come back and be productive members of our community? And Mr. Torres, lawmakers ultimately decided changes you fought for weren't needed. What's wrong with your analysis? Well, I'm, I'm happy to have the support of uh, Mayor Tim Keller and, and Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham. They both agree, and they recognize what every citizen in this community already knows. This system isn't working, and it's broken. It needs to be fixed. Um, one of the things that really will define this race is whether or not we're going to elect a career prosecutor or a career politician. We just heard a lot from Mr. Colon, but we didn't get a straight answer about whether or not he backs, fix, he backs a, and supports a fix to pretrial detention and release. I am somebody that has consistently fought to protect New Mexico families by keeping the most violent and dangerous offender, offenders behind bars. People that are accused of murder, sexual assault, child abuse, human trafficking. And I've learned how to navigate this system after my time as a federal prosecutor. This is something that's been tested in federal courts for the last 40 years. We know how to do it. We know how to implement change. We can do this safely and effectively while preserving our constitutional guarantees of due process. But we have to have real leadership and strength. We can't keep ducking these difficult issues and kicking the can down the road. And unfortunately, that's what's been happening in Santa Fe. We produce analysis and, and data points and discussions trying to justify a system that is absolutely broken. And, and the only thing you, you need to do is go ask Angel O'Leary. Her son was murdered by somebody who was out on bail after we moved to have them detained. He was somebody who was caught with a weapon, and he was wearing a GPS monitor when he murdered her son. That has to stop. People are sick and tired of this broken system, and they're ready for change. They need action, they need clarity, and they need leadership, the kind of leadership that only comes from spending a lifetime in the courtroom. My opponent has no experience as a prosecutor, none whatsoever, and you're going to hear him criticize my track record tonight, um, but he's never prosecuted a single case, not even a parking ticket. And we have to take a step back and start thinking and listening to the professionals, those of us on the front lines who understand what needs to be done to protect New Mexico families. 
Mr. Cologne, let's go back to that. Would you, you, you said if you got enough stakeholders coming together and deciding if we should change pretrial detention, are you for it or are you against it? No, absolutely. Look, I'm for protecting our families and making sure that the victims are recognized and they're seen and they're heard. What my opponent has is a failed track record of prosecution, a lifelong career as a prosecutor, <coughs> yet at the end of the day, the numbers are abysmal. Our community is less safe than it's ever been before. And at some point, you've got to quit pointing fingers and you've got to take responsibility. Look, he talks about me being a career politician and then throws around the governor and the mayor and all that. If he had that support, he should be very embarrassed that he walked out of the roundhouse without being able to pass that legislation. That's not leadership. That's a failure. What we have is a track record of leadership. We have a track record of working with law enforcement. And we have a track record of saying that we are going to aggressively push for these reforms that increase safety in our community. Look, I've got a 25-year-old son, a wonderful wife of 26 years. My wife doesn't feel safe. Our families don't feel safe. And I'm telling you, if you want to do the same thing over and over again, you're not going to get a different result. You've got to have the leadership that I bring to the table. We've taken it to the state auditor's office. We've done things different than we've ever done them before. We've held corrupt public officials accountable. And look, frankly, my track record is prosecuting cases as a district attorney in the DA clinic is better than my opponent's track record of prosecutions as an attorney. Mr. Torres, we'll go back to you as well on this. Uh, you struggled. Uh, you have a, a legislature that's hesitant to pass uh, crime bills. We came out. You were disappointed. Uh, what's it going to take? How are we going to get this done? Well, unfortunately, we, we still don't have the votes. The governor is, is, and her team, I know, is committed to this. She understands how urgent it is. I'm, I'm a little puzzled. You know, I saw Mr. Colon at the roundhouse taking selfies with his friends, taking selfies with the speaker. I never heard him speak up. I never heard him step out and support publicly um, our fight and the governor's fight for rebuttable presumptions of detention. And that's the difference between a career prosecutor and somebody who lives and dies by politics. I understand that this is a difficult issue. It's a difficult issue for the Democratic Party. But we can demonstrate to people that we can engage in reform that, that is in line with common sense, that is in line with community values. But we have to be clear. We can't have people who are guided by politics and who run away from difficult issues. I haven't done that, and I'm not going to do it in the future. Look, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what the presumption and the burden is of pretrial detention. We have plenty of cases where there's detention that's awarded by the judges. And then those cases are not prosecuted, whether it's the 18 year old that we're going, to, we're going to be paying a settlement for because of the incompetence of the DA's office, because she was held and then not prosecuted or not. Look, at the end of the day, it's an entire spectrum. It's a big judicial system and you can't hang your hat on just one piece. I was at the legislature. I have stood with people like uh, Representative Pamela Herndon, who said that she's got some ideas for making our community safer, safer. And we have stood with her on that. We have testified in front of our community members and leaders that we've got to have reform in this community and with our legislature in order to make our families safe. That's the work I've done. It's the sex success I have. Stores, would you like to respond to that? Well, look, you can, you can run the, the tape from the legislative session. I was there at the table in the well of the Senate arguing for rebuttable presumptions of detention. Mr. Colon had every opportunity to raise his voice. The attorney general backed this proposal, the mayor backed this proposal, the governor backed this proposal. But it's hard, it's difficult stuff. And for people who live and die by politics, I know they, won't, they don't wanna to touch those types of issues, but we can't live like that anymore. We have to live our values, we have to be straightforward with people, and we, can, we don't have to be afraid of taking a leadership position. As a career prosecutor, I know it's easy for people to second guess the work that we do. In the time that he has run for mayor, in the time that he's run for auditor, and now attorney general, my office has received over 100,000 referrals. I'm sure he is gonna have the opportunity to second guess a great many things. But the fact of the matter is, he doesn't have the experience when it comes to public safety. The fact of the matter is, is that we've got independent bodies that have evaluated the performance of my opponent, and they said he's a failure. He's below national rates. He's below the rates of his colleagues in New Mexico. So at the end of the day, yes, experience matters, but the voters in New Mexico want broad-based experience. This is not just a prosecutor's office, and there's a lot more things. I know we're gonna talk about them, but those 200 employees, they do a lot of different things, and the broad-based experience I have is gonna serve us well. And since we're on this topic, Mr. Colon, is it fair, as, as your opponent has brought up and called you a career politician, you know, he's prosecuted thousands of cases. He's saying you don't have that experience in the courtroom. When you prosecute that many cases, you're gonna have mistakes. Mistakes are gonna be made. They can't all be perfect. Is it fair to 
to judge him on his track record. It is fair to judge him on his track record, and I'd say that he hasn't personally prosecuted thousands of cases or tens of thousands of cases or the 100,000 referrals that his office has received. In fact, he was good at getting an increase in his budget from the Republican governor, but still has failed prosecution rates. He said that money would fix the problem, and it simply hasn't. Look, judge me on my record. Judge me on my record of engaging with community stakeholders and coming up with important solutions to difficult problems. Look, relationships matter. And if you want to call it politics, I'll say that I've got a lifetime of relationships. There's a reason these folks are supporting me. There's a reason that the community knows me. There's a reason that when I walk in the roundhouse, we're warmly embraced. Because at the end of the day, they know that I'm up there serving our community. And I'm telling you, we have done the good work in the auditor's office with thousands of referrals as well. We have done thousands of audits. We have held corrupt public officials accountable. We have held uh, you know, criminals and elected officials. At the end of the day, they haven't been able to pull it out on my watch. And Mr. Torres, we've done story after story on problems that have arose where you've had criminals come out, commit more crimes, where there's been issues with your office. Uh, do you take responsibility for that? Absolutely. We take responsibility, and, and I take responsibility for the performance in our office. But you, you have to understand it, and you go back in time. When I took over the district attorney's office, there were boxes. And, and you know, Larry Barker did an entire series where he came into the office and, and filmed row after row of boxes, four and five feet high. We had sexual assault cases and child abuse cases piled high. We needed money just to dig out of a, back, a backlog that we inherited. We had 8,000 un, uninitiated, unlaunched cases. But the real problem is, you know, somebody who sits on the sidelines and doesn't jump into the difficult things, it's easy for them to judge and second guess the kind of performance that we've got. Um, I'm really concerned about Mr. Colon's judgment. As somebody who's been advocating to defund the police for the last several years, I don't think he's in a position to um, stake any kind of leadership claim to, to public safety. And that is something we'll address. Uh, we're going to move on, gentlemen, to another question. Uh, focusing on mental illness. Mental illness has been blamed on fueling crime in our state. Close to 5% of adults in New Mexico live with serious mental health conditions. That's according to the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. We have two questions. First, what can be done to get these people help? Our second question, what can be done to protect New Mexicans from the mentally ill who keep getting out because they're deemed incompetent? Mr. Torres, how do we help these folks? Well, we need to rebuild this system. It was decimated after the last administration, and we, we really took the legs out from so many agencies and organizations across the state that were working hard to provide critical services to, to those suffering from, from mental health and substance abuse disorders. We obviously have to rebuild that capacity so that we can take some of the burden off of the criminal justice system. But as you pointed out, we also have to engage in serious legislative reform. Time and again, my attorneys, uh, initiate a prosecution of somebody who is who has a lengthy track record of criminal uh, in criminal infractions and criminal offenses and then they are deemed incompetent to stand trial and then because of the standards that have been put in place by the legislature we simply don't have the ability to hold those defendants they go back out onto the streets to commit new crimes we have to reform the criminal justice system and our criminal statutes as it pertains to people that are suffering from mental health issues so that we can give tools to prosecutors and police officers to take the most violent and dangerous people off the streets. Sadly, there are people with mental health issues that need to be in a hospital. They can't be out on the streets. They can't proceed in the criminal justice system. We need to come up with a new way. We need to come up with capacity for preventative services. And if we do that, we can build a safer community from the ground up. Mr. Colon. Excellent question. And look, while I've been in public service in this community for two decades, I've engaged with the leaders in the behavioral health and mental health community, whether it's Jeremy <laughs> Lighty or his colleagues who are really the experts, the subject matter experts. And they're working with me to advance systems that actually protect not just our communities, but also those folks who struggle with mental and behavioral health. Look, I have been at the table for a long time. We have a behavioral health, a behavioral health initiative tax right here in Bernalillo County. And I was the one that helped make sure that that passed. And I've been the one that has been calling for accountability to deploy those resources in our community because at the end of the day, we're not safe. And that also means that the people who have behavioral health issues and mental health issues, they're not safe for themselves either. And it is driving the issues in our community. But look, we, have, we can talk a lot about taking responsibility and whether you've been a great prosecutor or a career prosecutor, I would still say I've got a failed prosecutor 
standing beside me as my opponent. And those, those statistics matter. And, and we have a long track record with broad service and community engagement. Look, we can talk about the boxes and whether the boxes went away. And I know that some of Raul Torres' own employees will say the best way to get him to the office is to bring a TV camera. And look, I understand that that may not seem appropriate, but what I do know is that this community deserves better. It deserves better prosecution rates. It deserves better leadership. It deserves better engagement with law enforcement and frankly, passing legislation that's gonna keep our community safe. We are, we are absolutely fearful in New Mexico. And let me just say this, in rural New Mexico, they're troubled that this crime is going to expand into their communities because what starts in Albuquerque spreads throughout New Mexico. And again, I would just say, if you wanna drop big names in this race, about your great track record for legislation, I'm surprised that you couldn't get it across the finish line. But at the end of the day, we've got to work together, move forward, ensure that we have leadership. Leadership's what it takes. It's what it took for the Behavioral Health Initiative tax. It's what it's taking to deploy those resources and work with community stakeholders. Those are relationships I've had for 20 years. And with that, we're gonna to try to stick on topic here. This is dealing with mental illness. And, and Mr. Torres, should we be having more hearings with the dealing more dangerous, uh, dealing with the mentally ill? more dangerous hearings for them and keeping them, doing more to keep them behind bars so they're not being released and just constantly causing problems in our community. Yeah, we have a, a very difficult time inside the criminal justice system, the way that it's currently structured, uh, detaining people that don't, for example, uh, have a past history of violence or a past hi history of weapons, but they have repeated property crime, for example. And so one of the reforms that we need to engage in is that systemic overview of the legislative process. But I wanna go back to something that Brian mentioned earlier. You know, he equates running for office repeatedly with two decades of public service. Running for lieutenant governor, running for mayor, running for auditor, and now running for AG is not the same thing as engaging in two decades of public service. I'm surprised that he's claiming credit for passing Bernalillo County's uh, tax to help people with mental health issues, uh, but it doesn't surprise me. It's not something that um, I think it, anybody would be surprised in terms of trying to claim credit for things that he hasn't been involved in. And more important than anything else, he keeps uh, coming after our inability to pass pretrial release uh, reform up in Santa Fe. But again, he, he didn't show up for that debate. He was unwilling to engage in that debate. And we have to stop a politics that is focused on relationships. And we need to start having a, a, a focus in our politics on results, on leadership, and on strength. And those are the types of things that I'll bring to the table. Look, we can talk to the bill sponsor and the commissioners that advance that behavioral uh, health initiative and that tax, and they'll tell you I was there for the fight. And we got it done. And again, you know, I think that there's a lack of accountability. My opponent has said a lot of things that I've said I wanted to defund the police. I have never said I wanted to defund the police. Let me be crystal clear. What I've talked about is engaging community, giving them a space to be seen and heard, and then talk about how do we actually provide wraparound services to support law enforcement, actually increase our budgets for community safety. That's what our families want. That's what the communities want. And I gotta tell you, you know, the misrepresentation, splice and dice, it's all great. He's rarely held accountable, but tonight we're doing exactly that. We're gonna call it out for what it is, which are lies, misrepresentations, and frankly, botched cases and failed prosecutions. With that, we're going to the next question. The AG's office currently prosecutes around 800 criminal cases each year. Should the AG prosecute more criminal cases to help lower crime? We start with Mr. Colon. Look, absolutely, and those cases are often cases where local district attorneys take a walk. Look, as attorney general, I would be embarrassed if I'm an elected official and a family that has a victim, a loved one that was murdered, could not get a meeting with me. In all my years of public service, Raul, you call it what you want, but it's public service and the people of New Mexico know that. No one has ever had to protest in front of my office to say, I won't even meet with you. And now we're here protesting. It's never happened. It never will. Because as an elected official, you have an obligation to communicate even when it's hard, you gotta look the family in the eye and say, look, this is not a case we can prosecute. I've never had protests in front of my office and I won't as attorney general because we're going to aggressively work with the legislature to increase resources for district attorneys who are struggling. But we got some district attorneys who just fail to take the hard cases and we need the resources to step it up. We've got nine criminal prosecutors in that office of 200 employees. They punch above their weight. They do more with less just like I've done with the auditor's office. We've done more with less. We have prosecuted bad actors. We have held them to account. In the first time as the 
uh, auditor of New Mexico. We actually even held Big Pharma accountable as the state auditor because we took a different look at things. Not because politician and all the word salad that my opponent wants to use. At the end of the day, it's about understanding community, understanding the pain points, and then making sure that you are an absolute advocate for protecting and serving our families. That's what I've done. That's what I'll do as attorney general. With that, general. your time is up, Mr. Colon. Uh, Mr. Torres, would you like to answer that as well? Yes, I would. And, and I'm actually uh, glad that Brian brought up the topic of crime victims. Um, you know, recently, Mr. Colon decided to attack my record uh, by misrepresenting the facts about a number of different cases. And in the course of, of launching that attack, he actually used the image of a young man who was killed in this community, a baseball player. His name is Jackson Weller. Um, his father, Patrick, uh, issued a call to Mr. Colon to take that image down and to not use his son as a political weapon, as a political attack. He called on Mr. Colon not to try and raise money off the image of his dead son. And, you know, I've known Brian for a number of years. I've known him as a politician. I've known him as somebody who's been engaged in public life. But it wasn't until this last week that I thought he truly disqualified himself from public office. This is somebody who is a father, Brian, a father who cherishes his son as much as you cherish your own. He didn't call upon you as just a citizen, as just a member of the political establishment. He called upon you as a father not to use his son in that way. And I cannot believe that you as a father, somebody who cares as deeply as you do about your family, would ignore that call by Patrick Weller and use his pain to advance your political cause and your political agenda. You can try and lie and mislead people about my record all you want, but shame on you, shame on you for misusing the image of a dead boy to advance your political agenda. You owe the Weller family an apology and you're better than that. Mr. Colon. Look, I understand the pain of Mr. Weller, and I appreciate this out, his outreach. And I appreciate the feigned indignance that you have, Mr. Torres. But at the end of the day, shame on you for allowing that to happen. Your failed prosecution allowed that to happen. The judge admonished you for failing to appropriately prosecute the case that was thrown out before Mr. Weller had to bury his son. Now, I took no joy in that. But what I also know is that I took no joy in having my opponent misrepresent my record. I take no joy in knowing that two 25-year-olds will never go home to their families because of the botched work that was done in Mr. Torres' district attorney office. Look, we're going to talk a lot about those cases tonight. But let me just say this. I am sorry for Mr. Weller's loss. But I'm deeply sorry also for the community's loss. As a Lobo myself, I felt that pain. I understood what it was to be at the exact location where that man was shot. And but yes, you don't, he'll never you don't, be, look, you don't feel, I'll let you, you don't finish feel your the pain enough. feigned indignation, Raul, let Gen me finish Gentlemen. One. And I'll just say this, if he had done his job, if he had prosecuted the case the first time appropriately and not had to have the judge throw it out and then not have it refiled and then have him commit another crime, we wouldn't be having this conversation about this today. And yes, I do care about my son. And yes, I can only imagine that pain of Mr. Weller. Had he called me, I would have taken his call. But instead, he went and released a video, which was really a campaign ad. So at the end of the day, I wish they had just stayed on message, talked to the community about the hurt, but also talked about the failed prosecution record of Mr. Torres, because I don't think he understands the gravity of the mistakes that were made on the first case when this same individual shot someone else in this community. And, and I am going to let you respond, Mr. Torres, but just for the viewers at home, just to explain, this is a case involving the UNM baseball player Jackson Weller. He was shot downtown. His murderer had gotten in trouble three years prior, and he was not taken to trial for shooting someone on Central who did survive, was not taken to trial. So Mr. Colon is saying that this murder of Jackson Weller could have pre prevented. And Mr. Torres, you had judges saying that, you're, the, that the reason that the first, the, the first case was dropped was because you didn't meet deadlines, their witnesses weren't, weren't meeting deadlines, you weren't doing the interviews in time. And so you did have a judge saying and telling your office that they had dropped the ball on this case. And can you respond to that? Yeah, Jessica, and that, that's a great question. Um, one of the things that's been left out of this conversation is the fact that Darian Bashir was pending in another case at the same time, 
Somebody, uh, he had been accused of shooting at her from a motor vehicle near police officers, and we had a separate pending case that we moved for his detention. We couldn't proceed on the first case because critical and essential witnesses wouldn't show up for their pretrial witness interviews. And I understand that from Brian Colon's perspective, having, having never reviewed a case, having never secured pretrial witness interviews for anyone in his life, that it's easier to fall back and blame prosecutors who engage in this work day in and day out. But the, the simple fact of the matter is, the Weller family calls your attack a lie. The Weller family believes that you are misleading the public. The Weller family wants you to take down this ad and stop using their son for your political ambitions. And you need to do the right thing. If you want to attack me, you can. While you were running for office, I was handling over 100,000 cases in my office. So you, ha you will have an opportunity to try to trash my record. But don't use the image of a dead boy to do that. You love to talk about those cases, but you don't like to talk about the track record of success or failed leadership. And look, at the end of the day, this is about community pain. We deserve to know the truth. And look, there are two other families. Because Raul sent in an unlicensed attorney, an unlicensed attorney that you covered, Jessica, KRQE covered the story and held his office accountable. He said, I'm going to remediate. I'm going to fix the problem. It didn't happen. That same individual where the case was thrown out by an unlicensed attorney, now fast forward to this last week, shot two more individuals who are 25 years old who will never go home to the family. You should be ashamed of yourself. Brian. That failed prosecution matters. You should have had somebody in there that was a licensed attorney that understood what it was to get witnesses in line in front of the judge to take care of those cases. At the end of the day, you've got to take responsibility. I've taken responsibility for my failures. I've stood in front of the community and I've asked them to hold me accountable and I'm asking you to take account. And I'm asking you to do the right thing and not dishonor this family and run them over the coals and, and re-traumatize them. Shows excuse that this me, is a good story excuse me. For you. Please stop and listen. These are human beings. These, this is a family that doesn't deserve to be re-traumatized by you. So because, are the families that are Jess, excuse me, excuse me. This, this, this is a family that doesn't, as well. that doesn't need to be re-traumatized by you, you re-traumatizing families because every you day have for never, Gentlemen, I'm going to step in right there. Gentlemen, our viewers incorrect. get nothing when you're speaking over each other and they can't understand and they don't hear your point. So I want to keep it civil in here. Uh, we're going to go ahead and move on to our next question. And we're going to look at drug overdose problems in New Mexico. Since 2008, New Mexico has had one of the highest rates of drug overdose deaths in the United States. Between 2008 through 2012, almost every county in New Mexico had a higher drug overdose death rate than the rate for the entire United States. That's according to the current attorney general who sued pharmaceutical companies to combat the problem. We now face a new drug crisis with the synthetic opioid fentanyl. In 2020, the New Mexico Department of Health recorded 304 fentanyl overdose deaths between January and November, a 135% increase over 2019. As attorney general, who will you go after to stop fentanyl distribution? We start with Mr. Torres. Well, as somebody who has spent a lifetime as a frontline prosecutor, I am somebody who has experience prosecuting drug trafficking cases, both at the state level and at the federal level. This is a complex issue that um, requires uh, a, an overview and a strategic approach that really leverages our relationships with federal law enforcement, specifically the DEA, Border Patrol and Customs, the United States Attorney's Office. One of the things that I am extremely proud to have done inside the District Attorney's Office, and frankly, one of the things that have uh, skewed some of the numbers that I think my uh, opponent is relying on is the fact that we take so many of our cases into the federal system. We do that because we can uh, reliably detain the most dangerous defendants, including drug traffickers, um, but we also do it because we get more substantial sentences. But the real issue is that we have to tackle both the enforcement side and the consumption side. We don't have enough treatment resources in the community to help people that are suffering from uh, substance abuse disorders. Um, and that's particularly true for young people. There are very few resources for the number of young people that we see both in our CYFD system, but also in juvenile detention. I've partnered with the Adobe program here in Albuquerque that focuses on getting upstream resources. Once our juvenile offenders are out of custody, we, incur, we um, work with navigators to help get them connected to education resources, but also to drug treatment. 
that's the kind of thing that somebody in a position of leadership can engage in and scale across the board. And with that, that's your time. Thank you, Mr. Torres. Mr. Colon. Yes, this is a critical issue to every community in New Mexico. I've traveled all 33 counties engaging. And at the end of the day, families are hurting because of this drug crisis in New Mexico that was really led by Big Pharma and by the black market. And so for me, it's important to lead on this issue with making sure that folks are at the table. I want to applaud the Attorney General's office for the recovery that it has from Big Pharma. But you've got to do more. We've got to work with law enforcement agencies. We've got to collaborate and work together to actually address this issue at the ground level. Look, we know that human trafficking and drug trafficking occurs at a high rate down at the border in New of New Mexico. I've spent time down there. We've got a beautiful opportunity for economic development, but one of the major concerns is what is traveling along those same lines. Human trafficking, drug trafficking, and we've got to work together to better communicate. And look, I just want to say this, that I am not going to be afraid to lean in, update um, really penalties for these bad actors. We have done a lot to say that we're going to hold them accountable civilly, but I want to take it a step further. I want to say that these CEOs, <coughs> these big pharma companies, should also be held li uh, liable criminally. And yes, I think that can be done. And at the end of the day, I've done this work as the State Auditor of New Mexico. What you d may or may not know, uh, Jessica, is that we were the first state auditor, 27 state auditors before, never had multi-million dollar recoveries from the, from the private sector. We will have a multi-million dollar settlement from Big Pharma for overcharging on a million prescriptions for our elderly in this state. We've held Big Pharma accountable in the past. We'll do it again. Uh, but I, I agree that the law enforcement effort has to be collaborative and it has to come with leadership. You know, whether it's the sheriff in Doniana County or whether it's the federal system, look, these governmental entities, we've got the relationships to actually set the table and actually make progress for important solutions for New Mexicans. You've got to understand what it looks like in rural New Mexico versus urban New Mexico. And I've been in those communities. I've been with those families. And frankly, I've got personal stories in my own family, with my immediate family that has struggled with this very issue of drug addiction. I've seen what it looks like up close, and that's unfortunate. But I'll also close with this, which is, if we have that program of accountability and making sure that we're aggressively prosecuting those stakeholders or those, those bad actors, we've also got to make sure that we're taking care of New Mexicans who are in pain and in need. Outside of New Mexico, they've got great reintegration programs. In New Mexico, not so much. We've got to make sure we have behavioral health and mental health treatment programs for those folks who are coming back into our communities and we set them up for success. I know we can do it, Jessica, but we've got to work together. And I'm just going to go back on this a little bit and just, you know, the ideas you're proposing are not new ideas. It's stuff that's out there and it's still not working. What else can we be doing, Mr. Torres? Well, we, we have to redouble our efforts. We actually have to expand our enforcement capacity. And this is one of the issues that I think sets us apart pretty dramatically. Brian, even though he claims that it's taken out of context, and even though he claims it's not what he said, he has repeatedly advocated to defund the police. You're not going to get a, whole, a handle on the fentanyl problem, the overdose problem in this community, as long as you keep undercutting frontline police officers. He said that we need to educate the public about what we mean when we say defund the police. He then goes on to say that we need to reallocate resources away from the police to other agencies. That's the wrong thing to do. That's the last thing that we need to do. We live in a community that has at least 300 officers short from what we need on the streets of Albuquerque. And we have a shortage of officers across the state. We can't have somebody who's the chief law enforcement officer in this state advocating to defund the police the way uh, Brian has. And I know he wants to talk about creating space for other people to have a conversation. He did that in his podcast, which was part of his daily routine as the state auditor, while those of us who were actually trying to fight crime were rolling up our sleeves and doing the hard and difficult work. I know it's easy to sit on the sidelines and listen to um, ideas like defunding the police that are politically popular in one moment, but that's the wrong thing to do. It's a dangerous idea, and it needs to be rejected out of hand. Look, this, this commentary that, that Raul is advancing is dangerous. It's divisive. It's a page right out of the Republican playbook. Look, communities of color are in pain. They need to be seen and heard. They need to be brought to the table with law enforcement and public safety officials if we're going to advance our public safety in New Mexico. That's what I said. That's what I talked about. And I know that my opponent, it's a, it's a lot more uh, advantageous for him to take my words out of context. But I'll just say this. 
I have often stood with communities of color, but I've also stood with law enforcement. That's the reason I've been endorsed by chiefs. It's the reason I've been endorsed by sheriffs. It's a reason why we have the trust that we have around the state. And look, I, I uh, understand that saying, oh, Brian wants to defund the, sea, the police is really a great tagline, but it's simply not true. I've never said I want to defund the police. I've actually advocated for increased resources for public safety. That matters. It's a difference that is a distinction. And Mr. Colon, though, defunding the police, basically you're taking a chunk of the city's budget, investing it in communities, as you're <coughs> saying. So isn't that the same thing? I mean, that's what Look, I, I don't means. think it's a zero-sum game. I think it's, it's not a zero-sum game. That's why you have law enforcement advancing community policing. Constitutional community policing is what works. Whether it's Chief Medina or, or whether it's chiefs from around the state of New Mexico, they believe that that's the right model. So we've got to increase the amount of funding that we provide for public safety. That's how you build safer communities. But again, Jessica, that's not what he said. He talked about deconstructing, abolishing, and totally reworking the way law enforcement works in this country. He talked specifically about reallocating resources. And he said, in his own words, we have an obligation to educate the public about what we mean if we say defund the police. That's, that's an, exactly irrespon right. an the, irresponsible it's an irresponsible thing to do, and no one who has spent any significant time working on public safety and working on those issues would ever say something that reckless and that irresponsible in the midst of a crime crisis. Look, Senator Pope indicated that the, in the midst of the crime crisis that you refuse to take responsibility for when you're sitting front and center, as you so aptly say, every two minutes. Look, Senator Pope says this is divisive, it's not solving the problem, and that we do have to expand the pie. And that's what I talked about. Reallocating and reassigning resources doesn't mean reducing resources. It means from other programs in the city. Look, we cannot have a zero-sum mentality. This is not helpful. What's helpful is getting community stakeholders and leaders like Senator Harold Pope, who stand up and say, look, if you're not engaging communities on the margins for this discussion about what community policing actually looks like, you're doing a disservice to them and to the community at large. What Raul has been saying has not been working. He's botched cases, he's a failed prosecutor, and frankly, he's taken shots, shots at me that are just for political gain. And, with and that, at the end of the day, it makes him maybe a good politician. With, with that, we're gonna go on to our next question. This one is specifically for Mr. Torres. The Legislative Finance Committee analysts released a report earlier this year that found an accountability gap. Low arrest, prosecution, and conviction rates may have contributed more to the crime problem in Bernalillo County than releasing defendants awaiting trial. You've blamed judges, law enforcement, and the legislature for contributing to our current crime crisis. To what extent do you accept responsibility for our crime problem? Jessica, we have um, done extraordinary things inside the district attorney's office to dig ourselves out of a historic backlog. We have created the first ever victim support unit, never existed before. We established a crime strategies unit which uses advanced technology to solve crime um, that frankly had languished for years. Uh, my office is the first office in this state to use forensic genealogy to solve not one, but two unsolved cold case rape cases bringing justice to victims decades after the fact. It, with the volume of cases that we have, we certainly have issues that we still need to work on. We have work that still needs to be done, but that shouldn't de detract from the fact that our office has made extraordinary gains and strides in improving the kinds of justice that we provide for the citizens of this community. One of the things that we talked about, we issued a 15-page response to that report that you referenced, and we talked exclusively about the fact that there was uh, a misrepresentation of the data because we had in fact partnered with federal law enforcement and we had a number of people that we uh, sent to prison that were considered uh, to be less than fully prosecuted even though they were serving decades of prison time. And that's because the, the politicians in Santa Fe and the analysts that they rely on are, have zero context or understanding of the work that we do. They won't make any significant changes to pretrial release. They won't bring back the grand jury. They refuse to change the rules that only apply in this jurisdiction. Now, obviously, we still have work that needs to be done, but you cannot penalize people who have dedicated their life in taking on hard positions when my opponent has never taken on a position that hard. And that is time. And Mr. Colon, this question for you. You've successfully ran for chairman of the state Democratic Party. You ran for lieutenant governor. You unsuccessfully ran for mayor of Albuquerque and successfully ran for state auditor. Your opponent calls you a career politician. We heard it tonight. 
criticizes you for not having experience prosecuting cases, what are your qualifications to be the next Attorney General? I'm glad you asked because, Jessica, at the end of the day, this office is a very complex office with 200 employees, nine criminal prosecutors, <coughs> and over a dozen divisions. The 20 years were the broad experience I have in the legal community, both with civil litigation um, and with community engagement. It matters. It's that vision and leadership that I'll bring to the office of the Attorney General. It's working with law enforcement agencies for the last 20 years, engaging with them, working with them, and advancing uh, their messages in our communities. And at the end of the day, it's about putting the people in the right place to lead an office. All right? Look, you don't have to be a career prosecutor to be the Attorney General. Because at the end of the day, we've got somebody who's a career prosecutor who's got botched cases, his record's a failure. You heard a lot of excuses as to why those numbers were lying and how his third-party contractors came up with a good report that said why the, the report was incorrect. Uh, but we know about what stats say and what statisti statisticians do. But at the end of the, uh, this evening, the folks of New Mexico are going to know that you need broad experience, you need vision, you need leadership. And that's exactly what I bring to the table. I've been practicing over 20 years. I've been working to protect our families for a lifetime. When I buried my father when I was a teenager and he was just 49 years old, I was protecting my younger brother and my younger sister. From that moment on, the community helped raise me, but I've also made it my mission to serve that community that filled the gap that allowed me to be the first in my family to break the cycle of poverty. Now me, I'm working to protect my family and the families of New Mexico. And I know it's that vision and leadership that will make a difference going forward. And with that is time, I'm gonna ask one more question, uh, but I do want to please keep on topic. What is the most important crime law that the legislature needs to pass? Please be specific and explain how you can make a difference when the legislature is hesitant to pass more crime legislation. We start with Mr. Torres. I, I think clearly the most significant uh, piece of legislation that the legislature could pass would be to fix our broken pretrial release system. Um, there have been seven families uh, that we know of who have lost a loved one in this community to somebody who we have moved to detain that they were then let out and then went on to commit a different crime. Uh, we can effectively manage in the community low-level, nonviolent offenders, people who have substance abuse issues but not a long track record in the criminal justice system. That's who this bail reform system was intended to help. It was not intended to be a get-out-of-jail-free pass for people accused of murder, sexual assault, human trafficking, and gun violence. And I know that this is a very, very difficult topic, but it's something that we can't ignore. The governor fought for it. Mayor Keller fought for it, I have fought for it, and I will continue to do everything in my power to try and convince people in this community and the stakeholders and legislators of why it's necessary. Now, I know that people are reluctant to do that and resisting um, what I think is co a common sense approach to public safety. But when people went to the ballot box and voted for pretrial release and bail reform, they didn't think we were gonna be letting out individuals accused of first degree murder. They didn't think we were gonna be letting out people with lengthy violent criminal histories and, and a history of using weapons to terrorize other citizens in our community. That has to change. That's not what New Mexicans believe in. I've fought for it, my opponent hasn't, and I stand behind my record on that issue. And Mr. Torres, you're confident you can get this done? Absolutely. This is something that we will take time to build that coalition to bring people together. And when you take a complex issue like that and you try to do it in a 30-day session, this was a short session, you're always going to run into some obstacles. The next 60-day session is a broader um, space for us to give the opportunity for stakeholders and others and frankly victims. A lot of the victims that I work with on a daily basis were locked out of the legislative process. They didn't have access. They certainly didn't have the kind of access that Mr. Colon enjoys when he goes to the legislature. That's wrong. Victims need a voice in Santa Fe and if we start listening to victims, listening to police and listening to prosecutors, we would be in a safer community. Mr. Colon, what's the most important crime law the legislature needs to pass? Look, it's, it's got to be an, a, a collective approach in terms of individual crime laws. We've got to increase penalties for violent offenders. We have got to make sure that we're protecting our children and our families. My opponent, on the other hand, has argued in the legislature just this last session to reduce the criminal penalties for brandishing weapons in our community when committing a crime, to take that from three years down to one year. Look, at the end of the day, We've got to make sure that we're reviewing all of our, our criminal uh, penalties, particularly 
uh, the one that concerns me the most when I think about our children in this community. Look, never again should we allow what ha has happened with the Epstein case in New Mexico. We have got to increase our work, our resources, and our focus on crimes against children. And how do we hold those who commit those crimes accountable? We know that Mr. Epstein did not have to register in New Mexico after being convicted as a, as a sex offender in Florida. That can never happen again. That has got to be day one. It's an easy fix. We've got to do it. And we've got to make sure that we are providing the resources. Look, let me just, let me just also say when it comes to crimes against our children, uh, the Attorney General's office has a particular unit that addresses internet crimes against children. During the pandemic, we saw a sharp increase in such predatory behavior uh, against our children in our homes. Look, the, the federal laws, the state laws, th these laws were passed before the iPhone even came out. And at the end of the day, we've got to review all of these and make sure that we have a comprehensive approach to provide public safety and give law enforcement the support it needs, but also making sure that the victims have a voice. And I find it interesting that my, uh, my opponent here says that uh, victims should have access to the Capitol. I think he should just give them access to his office for a sit down. Again, a family who said he refused to prosecute a case against their victim. And I understand maybe it wasn't a case that should be prosecuted. And, and I'm going to stop but you right here since we're going off victims. Since we're going off topic. And I want to get another question in. With the legalization of marijuana or cannabis in our state now, how will you help enforce the laws, including specifically drugged driving? Well, the, the one thing that we need to do first and foremost is to, is to expand the number of drug recognition experts that we have uh, inside our public safety uh, systems and in our law enforcement agencies. One of the things that um, is going to be a challenge for us with the legalization of cannabis is that we don't have the same kind of testing ability that we do for people who are intoxicated by alcohol. And so it's incredibly important that we expand the number of drug recognition experts to make sure that local law enforcement is ready to uh, identify individuals who are impaired and to make sure that those individuals know uh, what they're looking for when they encounter somebody on the road. But we also have to engage in a lot more education. One of the things that Mr. Colon may not understand is that in addition to being a firearms prosecutor and a child abuse prosecutor and a violent crimes prosecutor, I was actually an internet crimes prosecutor in the unit that you just referenced at the Did Attorney you want General's to stay on topic office. Or not? And what and what he doesn't understand is that I engage in substantial we're stop, we're education, and I think it's important. We need for to us stay to on do. topic, Mr. So, Colon. Thank you, because I think this is an important question to the community. Look, at the end of the uh, of, of tonight, they're going to see that there's somebody who puts children first. And even on this issue of cannabis, we've got to put our children first, our children's safety first. I stood with the governor. I stood with the legislature on the legalization of cannabis. But I also remember the conversations that I had with Governor, then Governor Hickenlooper of Colorado, who said, look, learn from our mistakes. We maybe advanced a little too quickly. He said, look, we didn't think about the consequences of how do we label these projects, pro uh, products for our children. How do we make sure that we can recognize impaired driving for people who are uh, under the influence of, of cannabis. These are issues that have to be contemplated. So I look forward to working closely with the Regulation Licensing Division, working with the legislature, and yes, identifying those drug recognition experts. They're going to be able to be the ones that help us go from where we are to where we need to be, which is, again, leading with public safety, particularly for our children. Um, I will just say in closing on the cannabis issue um, that we've got a lot to be paying attention to, and we've got to have leadership on this issue. And for me, that means leadership working with law enforcement to find out what's working in the field and what's not, and then making sure that we aggressively litigate any, any kind of collective criminal activity that we have. Organized crime is real, whether it be human trafficking on the southern border or talking about these issues of the black market that's going to be vending cannabis without licenses. If we think that that issue, issue has gone away, we've got to make sure that those who are properly licensed are the ones that are selling to our community because they're the ones they're going to be doing it in a safe way and a responsible way. I look forward to advancing that work. Before we get to closings, one last question. We'll start with Mr. Colon. Can you say something positive about your opponent? I can. Look, I will tell you, I uh, have a lot of things I can say positive about my opponent. I remember the day that he was married to his beautiful bride up in northern New Mexico. They have beautiful children, and I have no doubt uh, that, that he is one of, the, one of the best fathers out there, and it appears to be just a wonderful husband to his wife, Nasha, and I, I, I lead with family, and I respect him for the way he cares for his family. Mr. Torres. 
Uh, I respect uh, and admire the way that Brian engages with the community. He um, spends time in the community and he's also dedicated to uh, his family. I know he cares deeply about his son Raphael and his wife Aleli um, and I commend him for that. Okay. Now we'll end with your closing statements. We start with Mr. Colon. Thank you Jessica and thank you KRQE for a great opportunity to be able to show the distinctions between me and my opponent. Look, I've got a 20 year broad based career in the law. I've got a lifetime of relationships because I've fought for families. I've fought for New Mexicans. And for me, this is the fight that I <coughs> want to take to the streets of New Mexico to protect our children and to protect our families. I've done it when it's hard. Words are thrown around all the time about politics, but look, I've not been political. I've taken my work for New Mexicans seriously. Whether it's when I held the former mayor of Las Vegas accountable, one of my biggest supporters in San Miguel County, she's no longer the mayor, Jessica, she's now a convicted felon. Or when I fought for democracy, I did it in a real way, not filing pleadings from Georgetown, but in a real way I fought for democracy and held Coy Griffin and Cowboys for Trump accountable. We made him give back the money to the people of Otero County that he misspent. We made him stop the fraudulent audit that he wanted to do on the 2020 election. We have fought and stood for the people of New Mexico time and time again. I want to take this fight up to the Attorney General's office and provide leadership, work with law enforcement, and making sure that we are aggressively litigating cases, whether it be consumer protection and serving people like the 90-year-old uh, widow of my mentor, who I look after every day to make sure she's <coughs> safe from predators in our community and around the country. My name is Brian Colon, colonfornm.com. Mr. Torres. Well, thank you. This, this is a consequential election, and this is a serious time in the life of this country. Um, we need people that are serious. We need people that have substance and experience. I'm a career prosecutor. I'm not a politician. But I think that's the kind of leadership that New Mexico needs when we think about the challenges that lie ahead. We need to build a criminal justice system that not only makes us safe, but makes us proud. We need to stand up and defend democracy against the voices of extremism and the tyranny of the mob. And we need to stand up and recommit ourselves to civil rights so that the government doesn't have the ability to tell any woman in this country what she can do with her body or her future. This so the choice before you is simple. What kind of lawyer would you pick? Somebody who is grounded in politics or somebody who has spent a lifetime in the courtroom doing the difficult things? I ask not only for your support, but your trust and your faith that I may use the blessings of my life to improve my home and the future that we hope to build together. My name is Raul Torres, and I hope to earn your support on the June 7th primary. And with that, we want to thank you both for engaging in what has been a spirited debate, and we wish you both very well. We'd also like to thank our audience as well for joining us here at KRQE News 13, your local election headquarters. The Democratic primary winner will face Gallup attorney Republican Jeremy Gay. Early voting kicks off tomorrow with the primary election to follow on June 7th. The general election is November 8th. 